you are welcome to our fifth PhD symposium. And today, our focus is on humanities research in Africa with a special guest speaker from Makere University, Professor Sister Dominica DiPio, coordinator of graduate programs in the Department of Literature and the HP Fellow of 2009. He will be making some presentations to us. Then we shall present our usual humanities research from our PhD students. Today we shall feature storytelling in Ugandan novels by Mary Naula and Nasana Grace Nyote will be sharing with us something from her a master's research on the impact of folklore on children's learning. Also together with us is a PhD candidate, Isaac Chizati Basima from Makere University Department of Literature also an AHP fellow who will be making a presentation on competition music performance. I would like to invite you in prayer led by Mary Naula. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this morning that you brought us together. We are grateful for whoever is represented here. For we know that you are the source of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And the Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Father, that's why we are here, trying to deep, dig deep into knowledge. And we are praying, Father, that you lead us and teach us because you are the best teacher. And we thank you for the presentation that is going to be here. We invite you to take over, lead us, and guide us, and be with us. We pray for your leadership. Father, we bless you. We thank you for our leader, Dr. Glere. We pray the Lord you bless him as he's working hard to make us reach where we want to reach. Father, we thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome, Dr. Joseph Fawori, to this fifth symposium and all the members, special welcome to Professor for being with us, Dr. Dorothy Mokasa, and Mark for the good reception we always have in this place. May I first ask our coordinator graduate school to say something, and then we shall invite each and every one to introduce themselves before we go into the presentations. Welcome. Joseph. Thank you so much, Dr. Cornelius Gulere. Um, it's a great privilege to be here, and uh, we thank God that this has been consistent, and this is so far the fifth of this symposia. It's not, if, it's not easy to actually bring people together every month, but we thank uh, Dr. Gulere as a coordinator for uh, this program that is, he has been able to, to mobilize and to solicit papers and presenters. And uh, this is the fifth in a series. Really, we need to appreciate. A word of applause would be sufficient for now. And. Uh, it's also a privilege to have guests from outside UCU today. Sister Dr. DPO, you're welcome. And all the other guests, I can't remember your name. <laughs> Isaac. Isaac and Grace and uh, Mark at the steering. We also want to thank you, Mark, for being available. I was worried that you should have been in Hoima now, but you are here. So we thank you. And 
for us at the graduate school, we are very happy that this thing is happening because we would like to advance knowledge and uh, would like to develop our, the PhD program. We are very young in this area, extremely young, and we are learning to start walking. And so every step that we take to walk in the right direction is very appreciated. And uh, so this morning, I think, is the last one in the year ending 2018. And I would like to wish you all the best in this discussion. I mean, it is also appropriate maybe to wish you a Merry Christmas. It's very close, very, very close indeed. In fact, I was worried that the presenters might be in the mood of Christmas and they may not be here. But we thank God that things have added up together and we wish you all good deliberations. In Jesus' name. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joseph Awori, for that warm welcome. Everybody, please feel at home at UCU. This is the Center of Excellency. Please introduce yourself. I'm Mary uh, Naula, a PhD candidate. I'm glad to be That's here. your topic, too. The bigger one. Yes. Um, my major topic. I'm handling depiction of cross-cultural conflict in Uganda novels. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Grace Nasana Nyote. I'm a master's student, and I'm handling impact of folklore on children's learning in Vushikori community, that is in Imbale district. Thank you. My name is Isaac Tibasima. I am a doctoral candidate at the Department of Literature, Makere University. I'm working on uh, a big topic entitled Song and Nation, a case study of the competition music performance in secondary schools in Uganda. Thank you. My name is Dominica Dipio uh, from Makere University, and I'm one of those who are going to present. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've introduced myself. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. I'm Joseph Ward from the Graduate School UCU. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'm um, Cornelius Wambi Gulere, Deacon, and Coordinator Graduate Programs, Uganda Christian University, Department of Languages and Literature. I am an HP Fellow 2010, and uh, I'm here because of. Professor Dominica DiPio, uh, who sought me out wherever I was and uh, included me on the NUFO Makerere project that was going around the country to research on African folklore. And that is how the readers of Busoga came to be known. So whatever I'm doing good, thanks to Sister Professor Dominica DiPio. And whatever I'm doing bad, that is my own humanity. <laughs> Have it and pray for me that I can improve. So you are most welcome to this symposium, Humanities Research. And uh, here we are really focusing on the things that we do well, that we do every day, that we love to do, and yet we know not that it's an important area of literature and research. It's my pleasant ple pleasure to invite Professor Sister Dominica DiPio, actually it's Sister Professor Dominica DiPio, uh, to take us through the humanities research program called the African Humanities Program of the Africa, uh, American Community of uh, Land Societies which started uh, about 10 years ago and has produced a number of scholars, among which you have three in this room. Yeah. You're welcome, Professor DiPio. Thank you very much. Let me start by thanking, in the first place, Dr. Gulere, 
the, the coordinator for the graduate seminars, um, for inviting us to come to share on the African Humanities Program particularly. I also want to thank Dr. Wori, the graduate coordinator, who is maybe my equivalent in the Department of Literature, uh, where I also serve as the graduate coordinator for literature. It's a real pleasure for us to be here. Coming from Makerere, it's a, and, and also being invited by Dr. Gulere is a great pleasure also, because I feel this is, you know, one who has given birth is becoming old and seeing the children grow. Uh, I'm so proud that um, Dr. Gulere is doing what he's doing in here, and I'm so happy that I've come also with Isaac, who is also my student and colleague in the department because I supervise Isaac. The basic thing we are going to deal with here is really to watch two videos on um, African Humanities Program. But before we do that, I thought it is important for me to say a few things about the African Humanities Program, which is popularly referred to as the AHP Program. The AHP Program started 10 years ago, in 2008. That was when it was rolled out, and it has made 10 years this year. After 10 years of excellent performance, the funders, American Council of Land Society and Carnegie Corporation, have decided to take a kind of breather to assess what we have achieved over the 10 years so that we can see what will be the new phase for the AHP. We are particularly privileged to expose and talk about AHP in this university because for a long time, most of the fellows have been around Makere University, and yet it's supposed to be a nationwide uh, kind of involvement because the AHP in 2008 was rolled in um, five African countries, and these are uh, Ghana, Tanzania, South Africa, Nigeria, and Uganda. It's meant to go to all universities in these countries, but somehow, maybe I should say, we in Makerere, the big brothers or the big sisters, should be a bit culpable <laughs> because we have not really um, disseminated the importance of this uh, program beyond Makere University. We haven't done much. That is uh, really something I must say up front. So um, our responsibility here partly is to interest you in UCC and later on we hope to go to also uh, maybe Kiambogo to, I know there are a few fellows there and I'm so happy that Dr. Gulere, who was our own at the time, he joined the AHP, is now here, also going to spread the fire of what the AHP is. So the African Humanities program came about because of the realization that the humanities disciplines are marginalized. And for a long time, government programs also did not, you know, fund humanities programs a lot. And yet, humanities is at the heart of what it means <laughs> to be human and to marginalize such a discipline in scholarship is really detrimental. So the Carnegie Corporation, 10 years ago, thought of funding very competitive uh, applications from humanities scholars that will be funded for one year to focus on research that is mostly awaiting publication. So there were two tracks for funding. One is for postdoctoral, which I was a beneficiary of. I was actually in the first crop of the African Humanities Program, and I came on board in 2009 and did my fellowship in 2009 to 2010, and Dr. Glary was in the second lot. But he represented at that time 
the category that was referred to as dissertation completion. And this is for people like you, especially the graduate students who are here, who are about to complete their dissertation. Maybe they are left with about a year to complete, and they are supported to bring that dissertation to an excellent complete, completion. So, um, and Isaac also is one of the fellows among the dissertation completion uh, applicants. This is a very competitive um, public, I mean, com uh, fellowship, but it has excellent benefits, which you will listen to in this video. And among the benefits is to focus on an individual scholar who may have been stuck for one reason or the other, you know, in advancing his or her scholarship forward, mostly to the level of publication. So the money that AHP grants you for a year makes you, you know, stop doing everything else and focus on your scholarship to bring your project to a publication level. One of the most important things the, the AHP actually preferred was to turn people's manuscripts to publications. And it's a rigorous process of publication where you have peer reviewers, where you have, um, you know, development editors, so that when you publish your book, it is going to be circulated widely. May I ask someone to just take this? I have a copy here of the, it will be circulated widely across Africa, across the globe, you know, but because it is African humanities, they want this publication to be principally available in Africa. I hope I am among the first uh, publishers on this series, and I, I believe and I hope my book is in your library, because that's what it was meant to be. Uh, so the, the advantage one is that you will publish. And what is scholarship without publication? The main thing about the AHP is Africa-based knowledge generation. For a long time, many times, the Africans sit back and receive knowledge generated about themselves, you know? And they are, they are more consumers of this knowledge than, you know, producers. So the AHP makes you really a producer of knowledge and sharer of that knowledge at that. Secondly, another thing the AHP does is for those who are fellows, to be, you know, given the opportunity to participate in a week-long program called Manuscript Development Program. Again, that is to get highly talented AHP fellows and advisors to look at your manuscript and tear it apart with your fellows to identify what is wrong with this document. And what is its strong point? How can you make it better? Many people have published so many articles and they have got promoted because they have sub subjected their manuscript to this very painful process of surgery that is done in this week-long week uh, manuscript development workshop. You will hear a bit of that from some, but, and, then, and then of course, there is like kind of mobility among the fellows that a person like me who, who started as a fellow has now moved on to being an assessor or a reviewer. That is, uh, we assess public, I mean applications, the annual applications that are submitted to the, a, to the AHP team. You, sus, you assess what publication is good enough to win the fellowship. And also, this is an African humanities program. In the US, we have the African Studies Association Conference. That happens annually. It's a conference about Africa and Africans. And Africans from the continent are rarely able to participate in that uh, conference. So what the AHP does is where a group of scholars gather and talk about African issues, and Africans from the continent are not part of this debate, is, is an anomaly. So they have also established something called 
um, African Studies Association Presidential Fellow. I'm glad to say that I've been a beneficiary of this. Also, I was the first to go as a presidential fellow to attend the AHP, I mean African Studies uh, uh, Association Conference. And here, there is a great opportunity for you to network, for you to present something about your research and fellowship to, to different universities. So it's another privilege, opportunity to open you and Africa through you to the rest of the world. And so there are lots of other opportunities besides giving you grants for conferences, especially when you are a reviewer and assessor like us, and to create greater networks. For me, this is one of the network opportunities we have right now. So the AHP over the 10 years has become a family that brings people together. So I would like to take this opportunity to interest you to participate. Once the call comes, this year particularly, 2018 to 2019, is a kind of recess period where there are no applications. It's like the funders and the you know, movers of this program are assessing what have been the achievements and successes and what could be done better in the next phase of the AHP. So there will be a next phase, which I encourage you to be sensitive to and then participate in. Now, I'm going to stop here for the moment to let us listen to the first video, which is an expository kind of five minutes seven minutes video that will make you listen to the AHP fellows and it will help you understand what really this fellowship has done to so many fellows. And thereafter, we will watch the second one, which is a close up on two <coughs> fellows who have benefited from the AHP and this benefit has made them begin to do things differently. <coughs> in their schools and in their university. And thereafter, we will have a discussion. Thank you very much. The, the humanity is about the human being. The way the human being lives with other humans, the way the human being lives with the environment, the way the human being lives with self. Humanities researchers are basically researchers that describe human experience. It gives you tools for understanding and analyzing society. In the context of Africa, the classics for us really are the oral literature. The reference Chenoa Achebe makes to African proverbs is for me a touch of what is classic. You know, the palm oil with which words are eaten. The humanities are the properly situated in the academia and actually in the value system of the nation in the past, and we're moving away from there. And we had very strong values because these values were being communicated through folk tales and, and all these other oral uh, avenues. And so we can actually see the impact of that in our community. What is the emphasis now? Our emphasis now is uh, make money whichever way you can. No sense of fellow feeling, no sense of national pride and identity. The values that we cherish have been weathered away. And now we're saying science and technology will transform this nation. But science without a human face is really not going to transform this nation. We are really seeing the results of that. Every new technology comes up to meet a certain human need. So my view is that the government approach of emphasizing one area and leaving the humanities behind is going to cause us a very big problem because we are going to overgrow one part of the body. I'm reminded of uh, Henstein's statement that uh, scientific invention is, mo is not possible without artistic imagination. People who come to the humanities to make something of it must be people who really love their discipline. Uh, before HP, I was just a teacher, but after HP, I became an uh, academic and a scholar. When I was doing my PhD work, I was exposed to a new theory uh, in, in the area of applied linguistics. The HP gave me the opportunity to publish using this theory. And in my case, what I really wanted to do for my doctoral program is what I didn't do at the time when I got the AHP award. 
Now, trauma studies is one of my major research areas, but this is actually an offshoot of the AHP research. AHP was my savior. <laughs> it was a time when um, three years had elapsed and I didn't have any more funding and I had not completed my PhD. That was my first postdoctoral grant. It gave me opportunity to network. I took up residence and I was at the University of Ghana. So a good two months of away from teaching, away from grading, you know the big numbers that we have to grade here. AHP launched my career path on a very interesting trajectory of publication. Now I'm trying to think around two book publication this year. And um, you know, I'm, I'm scared even that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> What the HP did was to give me a journey that has no end. I have used my experience and benefit from HP to serve the communities in the area that I'm best at, and that is the Lusoga language and literature. I got the Fulbright African Scholar grant. I immediately won the Caprex Fellowship. I won another American best uh, uh, grant, which is called Genographic. Shortly, I got the Volkswagen uh, postdoc fellowship. I got promoted after the HP program, and since then, my career has kept on going. When I completed my Fulbright fellowship, I got the Caprex fellowship. Currently, I'm a, a fellow of the Cambridge Africa Partnership for Research Excellence. The AHP started this program of sending at least one African scholar to attend the African Studies Association. I had never dreamt that I could read as a poet at the Library of Congress. That is what AHP does for you. Yesterday I get a call from the University of Nsuka. <laughs> They have uh, appointed me on their editorial team. So, <laughs> so I'm linked up in Germany, South Africa, Kenya, and Nigeria, and Uganda. So the HP has opened all these doors for us because once people see that you've been a fellow of HP, you know, the cloud that comes with that and the exposure that you get through all these different networks of scholars you interact with is, is phenomenal. HP also gave me an opportunity to go for trainings and one of them was a manuscript development training. That is the best thing I've ever had in my life. Manuscript development workshop was very helpful in answering the question of how do you come up with that article which is going to be published. I ended up in the history department and I was doing a lot of historical research already at the time. But the most fascinating was when I found uh, this uh, course on um, visual history. The things I learned about manuscript development, the things I thought I knew about writing an article, <laughs> you know, they, they were revised in, in just one week. I wanted a book manuscript. I tell you, this was over 500 pages, and the publisher in UNISA wanted something about 160 pages. That's another discipline of learning to listen to people who speak something about your book and how to deal with criticism. So that by the time you come out of this and your book is in your hand, you are a very happy woman. Uh, for us in the humanities, especially in Africa, is to get more aggressive and then look for every forum to do presentations that overarching presentations. We have just argued our case, put our foot down and take it to the highest level possible. Recapture the glory of performing arts. We the experts in the humanities are the ones to tell the world our value. Literature, drama, dance, history, linguistics, anthropology, philosophy, can all come together and look at a problem using you know, various lenses. We have uh, a debt, a big debt, uh, because these people came from America with good intentions, and these intentions should not die. It is in our plan for members of the department and those from other departments who have benefited from the HP Fellowship for us to conduct workshops 
in manuscript development. It is the benefit that I'm trying to bring to the art school. Then the art school should write to HP to say thank you. about the African Humanities Program because there are two recipients in this college. I'm familiar with this AHP because two of my colleagues, Angelo and Amanda, are recipients. I read through it and decided to apply about five years ago. And in fact, I considered applying. I've not heard about African Humanities Program before. When I returned from Dar es Salaam, MDW, I wanted to test how can someone have an article in 12 weeks. I now got the opportunity to introduce what I had learned there to the doctor students at their school. Uh, there were students who had been on proposal writing for about five or six years. Since Dr. Kakande uh, introduced this uh, platform here. We have been able during the previous uh, two, three years to have about two, eight, seven students who have defended successfully their proposals on PhD. So I requested him to coordinate the PhD. I was continuously writing and coming up with articles and, and putting them out. The, the best and of course for me was when I put up an article in the Journal of African Arts, which is where everyone would want to put an article. Because of our connections through HP and through Rhodes University where we've been doing so many things, we've managed to really come across to the African Arts Journal. Along the way I got a chance to write the forward. More than it, uh... 23 papers have been published from here by both the academic, the academic members of staff and our students. The benefit was also enjoyed by colleagues who themselves had PhDs and they thought they could um, somehow improve whatever question they had for purposes of writing a competitive proposal. I have benefited a lot from the manuscript development mode. They introduced us to this aspect of humanities which was not there before. And I know that um, a good number of uh, graduate students have benefited immensely. Both of them have uh, already been promoted to the rank of uh, senior lecturer. Angelo has already applied to become associate professor. But also Angelo is the, is the head of the department. For you to be promoted, you need to have supervised, you need to have published, you need to have done uh, community work. So they, they, you can work towards the promotion. So, and I think that's what Amanda and Angela are doing. AHP helps me to spill out that ripple effect to even the communities around me. Like I've been working with the deaf, I've been working with the blind, I've been working with the, the girl child. I created a garden. And this garden is like behind our flats. But then there was, there was garbage, there were thieves, who would hide there, so it was really bushy. I, I took the initiative to start cleaning it up, and I got rollies and rollies of um, plastics. So like in the long run, I've been like collecting special spices, plants, flowers, and then like planting it all over. The, the, the garden seemed to bring out like four different disciplines. We have uh, the fine artists going there, and when they go there, they are looking at uh, the landscape itself, how do you do landscaping, or how do you draw inspiration from plant life to, we call it objective study. 
or how do you learn this, uh, about these plants and you make a painting or uh, you design for textile because you know even textile you really need plant life. Students doing urban agriculture from SEDAT also. So they come to learn how do we turn a garbage place into something usable. The students also who are doing plant science, they also come to study, you know, the plants, plant life. And, and so in the end, it just became an academic garden. This is really a small space, but the way it is like having that effect, <laughs> yeah, I'm really grateful. As an individual, I have benefited. My staff have benefited. My students have benefited. At the Magnet Trow School of Industrial and Fine Art, uh, the, the main form of publication is the exhibition. The emphasis historically in this school had been put on studio practice. And uh, progressing from studio practice to learn how theory informs the practice, studio practice, and how studio practice informs the theory was unfamiliar. <coughs> Artists in this art school want to work in their studio. Each of them alone, and they sit on their work. When they complete it, they then present it. They are not under any obligation to explain it. Uh, they would allow the audience to interact with it and even add meaning. You don't have to analyze your work. You, you can even give it a title, no title. I work at night. I paint at night and I paint alone. I got my promotion through exhibitions. Probably I will not fear to say that it is more difficult than writing. Then for you to be able to make an, uh, an international exhibition, you need a minimum of around 35 or 40 paintings to fill a gallery. That must be having a specific theme. When Ahmad traveled to Rhodes University about two years ago, she came back with contacts and networks. I know one of which was Ruth Sembao, who became our external examiner here. Her interest and focus is to see that uh, Africans write about their own art. I remember our professors saying that you can't just let art speak by itself. You have to speak behind the art. A fine artist who is a studio artist is adding that knowledge of how to write about their art. I think professionally it is going to improve a lot on our ability to communicate. By producing a theoretical manuscript about an artwork, you give the viewer a starting point in terms of appreciating an artwork. I started as a studio person. When it came to pursuing my PhD, I switched from studio to writing. I discovered that my studio had become much more enlightened, had become much more open and receptive to different possibilities. When Kakande came up with this project, definitely there was opposition because Kakande was trying to take them away from their traditional, familiar, comfortable zone. Which is solving social problems. Uh, the approach we were used to, it was social science best. And then it came in and disrupted. You get to realize that there's not so much of a difference. It's maybe the approaches that are used. Mentorship is gaining the confidence of the person whom you're going to mentor. Dr. Kakande knows about the manuscript development and he can, uh, he can help. But he's had challenges to bring on board other people to come and listen. This school doesn't have a long history of, of writing. Some members just fear, I think. You know what it means to bring in new ideas? In families, you introduce a new meal, people will reject it. Of course, I resisted a bit because it was taking me away from, from how I was viewing things. And this resistance was coming from both the students and the academic members of staff. But then with the time, the students started realizing how important it was. Even those very same students uh, 
who had resisted him, now they opted to have him as their mentor. And realized that actually it does not kill my design. So it just, it just enriches it. And it doesn't keep you in, in one box. Four of the supervisors um, came on board. The one who resisted most came to attend one of the sessions. Say, hey, this is good stuff. How can we have everybody on board? How can I benefit much more? Then she gave us one of her um, articles which she wanted to present somewhere. And she won a, um, a, competitive, a competitive grant. I wanted to write about my story, but I didn't know how to do it. I'm now writing a paper. And, and, and I'm enjoying it because now I know how to do it. So um, what started as an experimental project uh, and when it started now producing successes for myself, Amanda, and um, the rest of the resident doctor students, uh, people in Chambogo who were having their own challenges with their doctor programs also got wind of this. From Chambogo what to the uniqueness there was that it moved beyond understanding the knowledge acquired within the learning process to, a, to an actual development of a manuscript that is worth being published. Manuscript development workshop was one of the, the formats in which we were nurtured. Now here I get an opportunity to attend the humanities workshop and Wow, I mean, that opened up my mind. Because I'm looking at women who are making beads, I found that through their anthropology, I could still come back and use that information to shape my artistic practice. My area of interest was merging public health with art. I struggled a lot to locate myself as an artist within a public health subject. With a introduction of the humanities program, I was able to locate my art within the disability studies. Changing someone is not easy, especially if they've had a, a long background into something. But I know some people have now started appreciating the way we look and approach things and the, and the enthusiasm we have when the forums come up. The majority of, of, of the doctors here, they haven't embraced it. Here we are supervised by those various persons and we also have those kinds of challenges. Fine art is a humanities. How do you introduce this program to the, to the to, to, to visual artists? They don't write a lot, they, they paint. We are on the program but we don't have funding. One reason we have failed to get funding is because the funding that comes to the social sciences comes embedded in, in empowerment and, you know, health, gender. It is probably too soon now to assume that the way this AHP thinking can be taken on board in the art school, just like that. Everything takes time, you know. It's not very easy to right away, you know, bubble out an idea and it gets up to the top. There's a lot of clutter of information that to sift through and get to something like AHP is very, very difficult. It is, it's, it's as if it's hidden away somewhere and you have to go very far and look through things to find it. As a university, we must be ready to sacrifice time so that people go away for some periods and come back. It also means that we should have additional capacity within the departments so that when someone goes away, there's no virtual. We are witnessing a situation where studio research is declining. There is also now uh, a need to look at how to improve the studio practice. I would um, recommend we could have more opportunities for writing workshops within the schools. To be a good supervisor, you should also be a good writer. To have a writing forum with resourceful people from outside so that they come in and give us these resources from the management, students, even undergraduates. 
it would be good to have it conducted by people from elsewhere because they are bringing fresh air, but not because that skill is lacking here. Our HP has ambassadors. And not only within the School of Fine Art, those ambassadors can come to recruit new writers. I would like to see Karitram Review, which will lead to the writing of a new program of art and critical studies. The other recommendation is to see this project resulting into the birth, growth and the development of a Ugandan art journal. I guess you've enjoyed it. Uh, we're now having question and answers. Sister is here and all of us are here to deliberate on this very important aspect of humanities research and the points that have been raised there, the suppositions and oppositions, fear of new knowledge. Mm -hmm. What kind of research professor or research supervisor would you like to have or would you like to become? Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, um, when I went to the fine arts school, I didn't know I would find a lot of opposition in that school because of this new humanities mode, as they call it, was introduced to the fine arts school. What I found there is that um, usually fine artists paint, like you heard one of them say, and these are not people who are necessarily involved and engaged in writing. They express themselves through, yes. And most of them do not publish. Most of them get promoted through exhibitions of their artworks. Yeah, but you know, an artist could also write about his art. It's not, so what the humanities uh, manuscript development program introduced in the fine art school is to get these artists to begin to write also about their work. And this is a new terrain for them, so they were quite jittery about it. And so, how do you write about an art piece in a humanistic style? That's the big argument there. Humanities um, style as you had in the first clip, video clip is, you know, you are trying through your research to analyze human society, to make people understand certain situations about humanity, and your conclusions may not exactly lead to tangible, you know, outcomes in terms of people's behavior changing, like perhaps um, the social science research, which is the action-oriented NGO kind of outcome required out of the research. So the challenge for the fine arts school now is we are used to, for example, an NGO asking me to make a painting about poverty or hygiene issues, and, and that painting, when I do it, will speak to people and the outcome will be perhaps change your behavior so that you know you will live healthier lives. Now, when you are turning that into an academic discourse and writing on it, perhaps you will be analytical in a way without necessarily pointing the direction to conclusion. And the truth about this is many times even when we write um, uh, fun, uh, I mean we write projects for funding from our development partners, the, the emphasis is what impact will this have on society? How is it going to change the community's life? And, and yet, the emphasis of humanity style 
seems not exactly directed to that. So that was causing some tension in the community, I mean in the school, and yet those who have experienced the new lease of academic life that came through the humanities approach felt this is so empowering because at least here finally they can look at their works in, with a totally new lens and um, also expose their works to other people to write with totally different lens as art pieces just as we do literary criticism. So that is the kind of thing which was quite new for them and um, you had the voices there. Change is not a very easy thing, but one of the things that um, the scholars said, the PhD students, one, one said I was struggling to find my feet with this research. You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I want to do my research in the area of public health and I'm a fine artist, you know? So when the humanities approach was introduced to her, she saw that she could actually do interdisciplinary research. So one of the things about the humanities research, therefore, is to open up to interdisciplinary discourse, you know? You can be a fine artist, but you can also be involved in public health issues. You can be a fine artist, but also engage with people with disabilities and other, you know, gender and things like that. So um, you, there was so much power, but you, you saw how difficult it is. And I'm sure my, my colleague, Dr. Glere, um, and me, I know for sure how difficult it is to introduce change in a system that is a, especially very rigid in the way it has done things forever and so on. So those are the challenges that uh, the fine arts school face, but you know, change is the direction in which we have to go. Recently, I was uh, in Ghana for this um, AHP um, conference where this uh, video was screened for the first time, and the major theme there is to think of AHP 2019-20 what will be the phase? What kind of AHP do we want? In the sense that, do we want a pure humanities? In the sense that, uh, you know, somehow even in humanities researchers, there is a demand on us to say, how is this thing going to benefit community? So how are we going to work out the new concept of the African humanities? So these things be kept, you know, differently, like social science research and humanities research, as one of the uh, fellows here, uh, one of the students say, actually, these things are not quite mutually exclusive. They are not really, they, they, they need not be kept separated. We could weave perhaps a new mode of AHP with some doors of, uh, you know, how we can impact society but impact society we must, because we know that we are already, you know, seen as people who are just reading Shakespeare, you know, <laughs> and nothing more than that. So we have to move from that mode to say, how is Shakespeare relevant really to society? And honestly, Shakespeare is way relevant. When you take Shakespeare to stage, to theater, you have no idea what consciousness people will move away with. The wonderful thing, and, we, and, and another group is really emphasizing, we should not move away from our humanities mandate. Our mandate is influence thought to cause critical thinking, and that is it. Many times people are running away from that. People don't want people who think critically because it makes life so easy for them. And we cannot let go that mandate. That's the nature of our discipline. If you go, you make a film, you perform poetry. Today, poetry, poetry is, is the thing. Eh? These young poets who perform poetry, you, you, they impact you. But the kind of impact that the humanities give society is not like the one that is putting money in your pocket immediately or that is going to make you materially rich. And I think it will be unfair for us to leave that territory which is immaterial, 
which is intellectual, which is spiritual, which is consciousness raising, to just go in the direction of the material where everybody seems to go. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, remarks? <laughs> it's actually not a query. I, yes. I've been part of AHP and um, sister is my mentor. Um, she's my doctoral supervisor. What, one of the things I noticed, and I don't know if you've sensed this about the way I even write and the way I speak about my work. Um, when I did my residency at UCT, one of the most amazing things was this kind of vibrant academic community I was part of. And because I was, sent over, I was at the Center of African Studies, you have people in different disciplines, anthropology and music and art and gender and all these things. Yes. So people come and present their work and all of a sudden you realize that, you know this is what you were talking about, that you realize you're so closed into your field that you don't know that there's a lot people can actually speak to your field with, even from their different mm -hmm. and differing disciplines. Mm -hmm. I know a friend of mine who has tried to get into AHP, but he's in languages education. And the first time he was told, unfortunately, we can't take you on because you are in education. And I told him, but no, you can actually get your work and work within the sphere of humanities because you're working with humanities education and it is languages education. I think it's also important that we understand that uh, disciplines are porous, that there is always, you know, the, I have a friend of mine in sociology and anthropology who has told me after reading some of my work and he said, I think Isaac, you belong this side. <laughs> you, don't, you don't belong that side. And then he's also told me, you know, when I present, because he's an anthropologist, when I present my work to these sociologists, they don't understand it. <laughs> But when I read your work and you read my work, we can understand each other. And I say, well, I actually use literary tools of analysis. And, and while you use anthropological tools of analysis, we can kind of connect in the way we look at, 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 at uh, these disciplines. Mm -hmm. For me, and this is a personal experience, I don't know about my brother here, but I think HP gave me the chance to realize that there's a lot more than our little disciplines. There's a lot more than just saying I am into literature or I am into history or I am into this. There's actually a lot that I can feed from in every one of these disciplines that helps me to understand even my discipline better. Because then I come out as a better academic, I come out as a better scholar, but also as a better student. That's, that's my thought, thinking through this, what we're talking about, but also my own personal experience. Thank you very much for that input, Isaac. And I think what you brought in here is uh, who, who qualifies, who qualifies to be a humanities scholar? Uh, must you be someone in literature, language, history, philosophy, those core, you know, humanities? No. Humanities studies is an approach. You can come from social science discipline, and we actually have, uh, we have had Two, two fellows who were from social sciences, but they used an approach that is humanities to analyze what would be traditionally considered a social science discipline, gender, which is always oriented to outcomes and so on. So you can come to this you know, from any discipline as long as you use the humanities approach. Thank you. Thank you, Sister DiPio, for this uh, enlightenment. Uh, um, and my background is from business, and uh, since I, I, I moved on to the graduate school, mm -hmm. I am beginning to understand a few things. Mm -hmm. Because tradition really has my brother here said, tradition is that disciplines are, they are within their own cages, mm -hmm. like animals in their own cages. Mm -hmm. You can't move to another animal's cage unless you want to be 
harmed by, by the wild animal on the other cage. So the lions are alone, the leopards are alone, and the rabbits and all the others are alone. Mm. But now, over time, I'm beginning to learn that actually these cages can be, they can be removed, mm. and the animals can roam around and benefit as they interact with one another. And so this issue of the humanist, the, the humanistic approach is really very interesting and attractive. We've been talking about interdisciplinarity, mm. sometimes even say multidisciplinarity. Yes. But sometimes people don't even know what they are talking about. Mm. We've been, for some time, We've been thinking about developing a PhD program, which is interdisciplinary. But almost three years down the road, we have not agreed what would, that thing would look like. Yes. And so the debate is going on. But you see, learning, learning never stops. So we have to keep learning. And I wish we had a little more people in this room from the various disciplines around here. And indeed, they were invited. A good number of us were invited. Yes. But the attendance is as it is. So we, we have to keep moving. Even with the few people we have, we may not transform the world tomorrow. Yes. But slowly by slowly, we will probably get there. So I'm very excited that you've been able to come and kind of talk about something I'd never imagined. I didn't even know what you were coming to talk about. And uh, as I continue to dig deep into the, your presentation, I listened to what the presentations on the screen was, in the, the videos we have watched, and your preliminary talk and introduction to this, I said, mm. life is interesting. Life is really interesting. Mm. And uh, as, you, as you have said before, you, you've come to introduce to us this approach and the, the AHP. Mm. And I think we will start from there. We are happy that at least Dr. Gulere is around, the man who is willing to, 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 to venture even where <laughs> <laughs> it's danger, dangerous to venture. And uh, I and Dr. Gulere, we can start the process. Oh, thank you. We can start the process and preach the gospel and see how far we can go. Yes. But uh, this is the future. Yes. I, like, I like the linkages that you have intimated here, mm -hmm. that uh, you can link even fine art to public health. That is something which many people would not think it's possible. Mm -hmm. the linking fine art to even poverty and so on. And so linking economics to humanities, linking uh, biology to humanities, linking even the sciences, the old science, the natural sciences, even to humanities is a big, a tall order. Yes. We need to learn to walk that path. Mm. And so this is a very good uh, meeting for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I want to just let briefly say that actually going interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary is a very challenging task. But people do it. And in Makerere, it has been said so many times, but it's, it's not all over that interdisciplinarity is at play. But one of the things that people do today in Makerere, especially uh, because I know that is um, research teams, how they make the, the composition of res research teams 
you, th this may be um, a medical research, but you will have a humanities person there, maybe a language person, a sociologist, an anthropologist, because people are beginning to realize definitely knowledge is not compacted in segments. They, they, they are with their lids open. And honestly, people in natural sciences are beginning to say, wow, so the humanities have so much to bring to this research. So the way to, to make you see immediately how you can go interdisciplinary is when there is maybe a research project, you get teams that cut across the disciplines and you'll see how enriching that will be. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Professor DiPio. Uh, to me, it is like a dream. I remember, um, I think the third or second uh, presentation, now I understand what Dr. Glair has been doing. <laughs> the last presentation we had, agriculturalist presenting. Yeah. I'm like, is that really Latricia? <laughs> but we, we didn't understand you, doctor. <laughs> now we are getting uh, the background. And he brought another Lusoga presentation, which was, you know. So we are, we are trying now to understand. I think this presentation you've given us is um, an eye-opener, and we are very, very grateful that is something that uh, we might benefit from. I, I personally, I came from a very funny background. I came from mathematics side. I used to like it. But when I came to UCU, um, I got a uh, doctor, is now Bishop um, Sheldon. Sheldon he, he insisted. I, I didn't want to do this thing, literature. But I told me no. You can. I said no. He said you can. Uh, so at last, of course, he won my heart, and um, I started literature, and I've loved it. And also, when I joined the class, I got Professor Wangusa, who gave me more um, hmm? the appetite to do literature. And I'm grateful that I'm moving on with the challenges, but I love it. <laughs> So this is so good, and I think we shall get more information as we go through the slides once more. Since it is in YouTube, we, we shall enjoy it. And um, the representative is here, so we shall utilize him very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And like you had one of the guys in the first video say, we have a debt yeah. to these people, and I, I want us you to challenge us from Makerere to support our own here, that we have a debt to share this knowledge and to also empower the people who have not yet gotten there so that they can go. We, we, we will be happy to be involved for mentorship. Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm. Like Dr. Hadredi uh, talked about I also came in here not really knowing what was going to happen. I knew I was just going to meet my supervisor and <laughs> a few things. But I'm excited to hear this. And there is one major thing I'm coming to understand that it's very important for all disciplines to work together. And in my mind, I'm painting a picture of our body, the way the body functions. There is no way the eye can say they don't need the leg or they don't need the heart or something. So all parts of the body need to help each other in order for the body to function normally. And there's something that came out uh, in the presentation. There's somebody who said, it's not good to concentrate on only one discipline because then you'll be overgrowing only one part of that body. And so it is something that is interesting. I've just heard about it, but it is worth uh, following and getting to internalize. Thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. Actually, I remember um, one of our presentations before Professor, Muranga, uh, Professor Wangusa went. He told us, I wanted to do my dissertation on oral literature because that's what I did uh, in the master's. And he said, no, we are not just pre preparing you to uh, be a supervisor or a specialist 
in a specific corner there. No, we want you to be a, a, a all-round person that even if when you're taken to social science, you are able to do something. You don't need to be in a cocoon somewhere. And I we're like, what are you talking about, Professor? But I think this is coming out so well, and uh, we are happy. <laughs> thank you. I'm really impressed. Uh, thank you, sister, and all members for your comments. Did you have a comment, Paul? You came in at the tail end. Yes, you'll catch up. Just to say and to underscore what has been said there, that usually the fear of the unknown leads us to miss the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Owori, you are well aware of our humanities um, research, which we call the action research on writing, uh, translating, and publishing for children in local languages. It has had that kind of hitch, and uh, the points have been well labored there, so we do not have to transplant the, the, the Department of Languages and Literature into Faculty of Arts in Makerere. <laughs> it is the same experience. <clears throat> to the extent that uh, uh, some students were so, so, you know, aggressively against it that they wrote uh, a very bad letter about their, uh, their, their teacher. And uh, when this letter was written, <clears throat> Some people were frightened in the department, saying now, uh, Dr. Gulere is new in this department and everything is going bad around him. Uh, let us re withdraw this letter. We shouldn't let it stay there. And I told them, no, please. That letter is a good letter because it is part of the research. It is part of the findings. Let us keep it there so that we can use the letter to know how to progress mm. in this endeavor to give the students and the staff a uh, good humanities orientation. And as we talk now, from 11 students, we were able to get about 150 storybooks in uh, 15 languages. And now we have over 1,500 storybooks in 26 Ugandan languages, including Yoruba wow. and Latin all running online through this effort of community service and also writing not with money in mind but with a critical mind to inform society. Mm. And here the department is focusing on how can the department use the resources available in this university to serve the communities. The House of Bishops had complained about children, especially in the holidays, languishing around and they have nothing to read. They are being taught in their mother tongue, but they have nothing to study. They are always rushing for television and uh, their parents' WhatsApps and mobile phones. And in that way, we are not helping society. So how can we as scholars and researchers, teachers and students of literature, help society. So this project has been served by people from all the disciplines, from all the faculties, from all the units. The cooks helped so much with Kumam. Uh, the, some people from Human Resource helped with, the, with the Lukonzo. Uh, and so many, uh, our dear uh, Dr. Wari and, uh, and Mary helped with Dopadola. And so we have been moving like that. And uh, last time when we were launching one of the students' books in Lango, who has written two titles and has been selling a copy at 8,000 8, shillings to raise his school fees, it downed on some of those who were resisting that actually this could even become a business. But first, it is knowledge. And then secondly, information. And then after that, it can become anything, values, and the rest of it. So I'm very glad that uh, Uganda Christian University can have a taste of this. Like Mary was saying, we had at one time here uh, self-acclaimed poets and presenters in Lusoga, a mother and a son. 
they came here and gave us very, very nice presentation about Kampala. Some of us, a kind of Kampala that we didn't know, but they had put it in poetry and they acted it here for us. And then we had a PhD student who is soon to uh, defend. He was talking about um, uh, how ICT can be used in uh, agriculture to monitor information about particular programs in farming. And she did this in, uh, in Kenya. So she came here and also gave us her perspective. So you are also coming here to give us this other perspective to, to close our year, but also to help us reflect better on the five sessions that we've been going through. My friend Grace here was afraid that she wouldn't tell us anything, but now I know that she's uh, happy to tell us some of the Luma Saba stories. Eh? Isn't that so? So thank you very much and welcome Vidivawa. Uh, who is also a master's student, and sh she will tell us together with her friend uh, Paul Mulumbi, a master's student. They are both in their first year, and uh, we are excited to have you around. So, sister, please, you welcome and uh, take our word round that we are alive and kicking. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will be happy to come back here. This is a wonderful place. And we are very happy that it is growing to be a very vibrant, you know, uh, community of scholars. Thank you very much. <laughs>